I'm going to welcome first of all our, um, Caroline, Dr. Caroline Elton. And um, Caroline, since 1998, has worked in medical education, uh, including setting up and running uh, NHS funded career support service across 70 hospitals in London. And, and then subsequently, she's left the NHS and runs a, a specialist career consultancy. Uh, but many of us know her for her book, uh, which was published in 2018. Um, also Human, The Inner Lives of Doctors. And if you've not read it, I, I do recommend it. It's, um, it gives us so many insights into um, working with our students. So um, it's a real pleasure, Caroline, to welcome you today. And uh, if you'd like to um, share your slides and, um, and then tell us about uh, your talk, which is um, almost or also human, uh, a bit of a variation of the book title. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I'm hoping that people can hear me. It's a very um, strange experience, particularly when you're the presenter, because you don't even see the little thumbnail pictures. So um, I, if people can't hear me, uh, then I hope they'll be able to, to yell. Okay, so my talk is called Almost or Also Human. Um, and it's called this because about two years ago, I was giving a talk at Gresham College in London, which is a very ancient foundation for the public uh, understanding of science and other issues as well. And I had a really bad attack of uh, imposter syndrome. The previous speakers had all been extremely illustrious and I was thought, why have they asked me to do this? And I got introduced as the author of Almost Human, rather than also human. And that was just the first, or the first time I really clocked it. Um, it's just been the first of very many instances. And so I suppose I'm, I'm interested in, and what I want to share this afternoon is, why has this strange thing, why, why have people introduced me as, as the author of Almost Human? What is it about training to be a doctor or practicing as a doctor that makes people feel that they're almost rather than also human, also human with their patients? So that's what I'm going to be looking at. Um, oh God, my slide is not going on. Let me just... Oh yeah, it is. Okay, thanks. That's actually the book, also Human, the, the Inner Lives of Doctors. And it, as Jonathan said, it was published in 2018. That's the hardback, there's now a paperback out. So I'm aware that this is the post-lunch, post-prandial dip slot. Uh, and so I'll try to keep people um, awake, even if I'm keeping them awake when they're going to their own kitchens because their cameras are off to make their cups of coffee, that's absolutely fine. Um, so what is it about then, about training as a in doctor or in other clinical professions that make, can make people feel as if they're almost rather than also human? Um, well, the Simon Sinclair, who may, many of you may have read his book, Making Doctors, was a psychiatrist who then went off and did a PhD in anthropology on the side. And he didn't go off to Borneo or somewhere. What he actually did was he studied his tribe, was the medical tribe at UCL. And, and I think his book was published in the 70s. Medicine, unlike the military, is not interested, scientifically interested in its recruits psychological experiences, either their individual morale or the esprit de corps of their groups. Psychology is a low status discipline. And I've definitely, as a psychologist, I've definitely sometimes felt that in the different jobs that I've had in, in medicine. Now I've looked at it slightly differently in my book and I, I called it a psycholectomy. That's just a term I made up, but it's a lack of attention to the clinician's psychological functioning, permeating clinical training and practice. Now, I dare say that the people who are attending this group this afternoon do not uh, look at medical education through the uh, psycholectomy lens, but I think that many people do and what I'm going to try to do is by looking at different areas, think about how there's been the removal of a psychological understanding. So I'm going to think about whether we help students understand the motivations for choosing the profession. We support students who may not be suited to the profession, whether we help people to understand the psychological demands of clinical work. We think about transitions and seeing the bigger picture. That's what I'm going to aim to do. 
Um, in terms of just one thought came to mind, understanding the psychological demands of clinical work. I had a, saw a trainee once who said to me, I didn't realize there were going to be so many sick people when I worked as a doctor. Now, on the one hand, you can think that's incredibly stupid, but on another, you can think it's incredibly honest. And how many of them, when they're doing well in schools and family and teachers are all encouraging them to do medicine, and that's the sort of goal and veterinary medicine too, but also for other professions, how many of them are actually saying to them, do you want to be working with sick people? So the first area I'm going to look at is helping students understand their motivations. And I will briefly tell a story which I tell in the book, which is of a doctor who came to see me when I ran the careers unit for London Deanery. And she was had just began, she'd finished her core medical training, she'd just begun training in oncology. And about six weeks into her, uh, her oncology training, she'd gone off sick. Um, she had crashed her car twice. And it wasn't that she was just a lousy driver, she'd never ever crashed her car before but she'd crashed it because she was so desperate to get out of hospital each day and get back home so I did what I always do in in that I take a detailed educational not a psychological history really but an educational and training history and I talk people if they're in uh, three year, three, what she would have been sort of fifth year post leaving med school. I asked them about the rotations they've done in med school. And she remembered, she, she was from a, um, a Asian background. She remembered that when she had walked onto the oncology ward at the hospital where she trained, um, there had been a man from a similar cultural background as her own, a middle-aged guy, bald from chemo, and she had fainted. She just walked out of the lift onto the ward, seen this guy and this bald middle-aged guy from her own cultural background and she had fainted. Why had she fainted? Probably because her dad had died of cancer and he had been bald and in hospital and she had visited him. And that was just the first of the pieces of uh, information that, that made uh, her think that maybe she wasn't very well suited to oncology. She described it to me as continually scratching open a, a, a wound. Now, I am not saying if somebody faints, they shouldn't do that specialty or they shouldn't be in that profession. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that if we're providing student uh, support to students, Ideally, we want to, to make our students curious about themselves. And we want to make our students alert to the fact that they will all have illness histories of their own illness and their family illness or close friends illnesses. And these can be triggered as they go through different specialties. And how wonderful it would have been if that trainee had been curious, had known who to go to talk to, and had maybe at that stage thought, yes, I want to do medicine, but perhaps oncology is just a bit too much for me. And, and then actually before she'd done oncology, she'd done some, uh, before she got a training, she'd done some SHO work in oncology, oncology and found it really distressing. She had worked um, with um, cervical cancer patients and some of them were young and she had to tell them that they were going to not going to be able to have children later on. And she'd found it very upsetting. And why then would she have chosen it? Well, I think we have to, understand how much if somebody has gone through a traumatic experience how much they want to make sense of that experience how much they want something good to come from their experience how you'll see if there's been a, a trauma or a miscarriage of justice or whatever it is people will say we want to make sure that others don't go through this that's perhaps the motivation for uh, you know this there's there's some um raising money for a hospice people want to give back they want to make sense and that's a very natural and that's a very important and wonderful human 
characteristic. And I'm not in any way wanting to wanting to say that shouldn't happen. But we do have to realize that it can lead to a distortion because you can want to give back so much that you can perhaps oversee the ways in which you're not actually a lion, you're just a little pussycat, that you may not be suited for any number of different reasons. For this client, it was just too much. For other clients, it may not be playing to their strengths to be going into the specialty where, where a loved one ha uh, has you know, linked to the treatment of a loved one. And so I suppose that this is just a plea. One of the things of doing things differently would be about making students alert to their Ill own personal illness and family illness histories and, and not pathologizing that, normalizing that and making students alert and curious about. This was not somebody who hadn't been out drinking the night before. This was not something that had happened on any other occasion. It was that occasion when she fainted. And it would have been lovely if she could have talked about it because she was extremely distressed as a trainee oncologist. And she'd actually, she'd walked out. She, she, she um, resigned her number. But there is a happy ending with that story. She went on to um, trained successfully as a GP and I tracked her down for my book and she's loving GP and so it's got a happy ending. So that's something about how we don't encourage people to think about their motivations for the profession and for, sub, for, for particular areas within a profession. This is a tricky one. And in my initial talk, I'd put it first, but then I thought that's a bit sort of for the postprandial dip, that's a bit depressing. But it's something I feel very strongly about. And it's something that I, I felt strongly about when I saw doctors in the careers unit who, who failed, who were not getting through F1. And because of my, because I'm an academic and practicing psychologist, I took a history. I found out then that they had these very, very troubled medical school trajectories. Now, because I am an academic psychologist, I can see that there may well have been others with equally um, difficult, complex trajectories through medical or veterinary school who went on without any difficulty. They didn't come banging on my door, so I didn't know about them. But I certainly found that some people, that there were some people I saw, particularly those who, who couldn't cope with F1 or F2, and, and they'd had really, really troubled medical school histories. Um, I'm seeing somebody this week, I continue to do freelance work for the London Professional Support Unit, who's, who's been given an outcome for in his foundation year two. He failed year one, he passed on resets. Failed year two, passed on resets. Failed year three, passed on resets. Failed year four, failed on resets. Passed on when he re when he redid year four and he got through finals fine. He couldn't get through FY1. They gave him an extension. They signed him off FY1. He's had a year in FY2 and they're not signing him off. And, and it's because I saw those doctors and sometimes, you know, people who'd been 10 years in med school. And in theory, it doesn't happen, but in practice, it does. So this, I know, is very sensitive, but I'm interested in whether we could apply the idea of the psychological contract which is the idea that it's an employment it's a parallel to your employment contract which is all about pay hours of work terms and conditions that in an employee to an employer to an employee actually there's an implied psychological contract about the expectations that the both have each of each other of their values their motivations their ambitions how they will be treated and i think that um there is some fuzziness around this because nowhere is it really laid out. And I think that this should be laid out, not in the Dean's talk on day one. I think this actually needs to be laid out in the material that gets sent to careers advisors. It needs to get laid out in the material that students see when they decide if they're going to apply for medicine and apply to a particular school, that some people are not going to actually be cut out for the practice of medicine. 
medicine, because how can it not be the case? Medical, and often this is around kind of the issues of resilience. It's not only, but when it's problematic, some people just decide it's not for them. They're not that interested in medicine. They don't want to work so hard. They don't want to be in training so long. But it's often people who want to be a doctor, but actually find it intolerably difficult. And I think that we need to have a conversation and we just need to understand that resilience hasn't been adequately assessed by the selection process. And that's not a failure of the medical schools. It's just that it's difficult to do it to, with the available selection methods. Post-selection, you need to identify those who are likely to need more support. If you do it pre-selection, it won't work. People won't come up with the goods and tell you actually some stuff about them. Support for these students needs to be put in place. If after the provision of extra support, the student's still not able to cope, they should be given lots of help to switch out to a more appropriate course. And sim similar arguments apply to subsequent selection stages. Um, but and this is sort of being done, and I found one example because my book was published in the States as well, that what it's a new medical school, every student has a one-to-one -one confidential interview. It's not going back to the academic side of things with a member of the student support. And prior to this, they're really looking support their life events and the student adapted of a general physician wellness thing. And I don't, I might be wrong, and it'd be marvellous if many medical schools are doing this, but I, I doubt whether every medical school in the country is really trying to understand who is likely to be vulnerable and putting, uh, putting in the support for them. And Jen uh, Cleland at Aberdeen has written quite extensively about the, the failure to fail. And, and I think as somebody, because often, there's been a gap between the undergraduate and the postgraduate. People don't necessarily know what happens to some of those doctor students who've struggled in med school. And I'm not saying that they all continue to struggle. I am saying I know that is the case because I see them privately. I see them in my professional support unit. Some of them continue to struggle. And the longer it goes on, the harder it can be because there's just feel they've invested so much in it. To, to move. Um, so there's a need, and I hope that this is being done by the UK Med, um, which many of you will know um, is, is, is a sort of database where there's a, they're trying to pull together uh, different sources of information. Because I think it would be wonderful if we could allocate those who are more vulnerable to really good foundation training practices and you know rather than the, and because actually what happens and I describe this in the book there's a inverse care law inverse care law which is devised for in, in terms of originally was thought about in terms of the, the most vulnerable needy patients getting the worst care and actually there's an educational equivalent of it because we we those who've done have uh, those who for whatever reason and it's not all of them because some people are very vulnerable but academically brilliant so it's not all of these but some of them who for whatever reason have struggled and have done not so well are more likely to not less likely to get their choices, first choices. So they're less likely to end up with family support around and they're more likely to go to places that other people don't want to go to. So I think it would be wonderful if we could, if we could allocate the most vulnerable trainees, the best foundation placements. And then if it doesn't work out for them, we would be able to say, this isn't the right, maybe this isn't the right career pathway for you. And we could help and then put in the help to think what else they could be doing. So the third area of the psycholectomy is understanding the psychological demands of clinical work. Um, and as I said, you know, a few minutes ago, this this trainee who said to me, I didn't understand that, didn't realize there'd be so many pick sick people when I worked as a doctor. I thought it was a I thought it was incredibly brave and incredibly honest. And I didn't think it was a it was a very shocking remark, but I didn't think it was a stupid remark. And I'm now going to make a very bold suggestion. And it's a suggestion that I wrote up in an essay for the bit, I was in, asked, um, invited to write an essay for the BMJ. 
And in the first time I wrote it, um, I hadn't, in my first draft, it was peer reviewed. I hadn't explained myself very well. And one of the peer reviewers wrote furiously in the margin that this was nonsense, because what I was talking about was parallels between the kind of psychological demands of caring for a patient with the psychological demands of caring for a baby. And the reviewer wrote in the margins, I do not feel for my patients as I feel for my children. And that was my failure to make my point clear enough. So I'm not saying that caring for a child and caring for one's patients are identical. But I am saying that if we start to deconstruct aspects of maternal care, it can shed light on aspects of medical care that are often overlooked. So we can go a step further and think about when care is problematic for the carer. So if we look at postpartum depression, um, we know that the postpartum period is uh, uh, associated, postnatal period associated with increased disturbances. Um, we know that it has an effect on the infant. But crucially, there's little, a little evidence to support biological basis for postnatal depression. Instead, psychosocial variables are more important. I'm not talking about postnatal psychosis here, I do want to say. It's stressful life, life events, the, the relationship with the, um, their partner and lack of so, social support. And I think that there are that sort of maps on to some of the things uh, that can be going on with a, a, a young clinician who has to step up and assume responsibility. Now, the naysayers in the audience who may want to go back to know it's much more of a biological rather than a psychosocial issue. Um, I didn't know about this, but common sense told me that it must exist. If you're arguing that the postnatal problem, postnatal uh, uh, psychological issues are to do with the kind of psychosocial demands of caring for this new baby, then you might predict that when you have a, a very dramatic and sudden um, demands placed on you in adoption, that you would find uh, some, you would find an echo of that, and indeed you do. So how can we understand this from a psychological perspective? When we're tasked with caring for others, we draw upon our own experience of being cared for both currently and also in the past. We need to know that there are people there who respect us and will support us. People who are telling us, yes, you're good enough to do this job, be you a new mum or, or a, a foundation, a dentist, a doctor, a vet, whatever. And they'll give us support when we need it. This is crucial for new mothers, and it's crucial for new clinicians. And it's crucial every time there's a significant step up in responsibility. Um, so this idea that we're drawing on our own experience of being cared for. And if those early experiences were good and secure, we're going to find caring, and there's a whole literature on this more, more straightforward. And if it was very problematic, we might find caring more problematic. And Gwen Adshead, um, who some of you may have heard of, a very eminent forensic psychiatrist, who has written about this in terms of uh, models of attachment and how early attachment, that's the, the psychological representation of the infant that is, is developing in their brain to their caregiver, becomes representative represented cognitively in the brain as an internal walking, working model, complex schema of images, beliefs, and attitudes towards attachment relationships. This, and she terms this the caregiver icon, which is engaged psychologically when the individual is in need of care and has to, or has to provide it. So how we were cared for in infancy influences how how easy, how easy it is, how easy it is for us to be cared for by others, and how easy it is for us to give care to others. Um, and I'll just very briefly. There's also so there's our own experiences, and there's the issue of support. And this is Eva Evans' book was published last year, and she talks about a mistake. And I think she's illustrating this beautifully. I carried a mistake around heavy on my chest, close around my throat. 
I hardly knew what to do with it. There were days when I really tried not to think about it. But even on those days, it was always there, still and looming as the reason I was afraid to think about anything at all. After some days, she'd gone to talk to her consultant about it. And he'd been, you know, sort of these things. It was missing. It was missing something on an X-ray. But it turned out to be it had a catastrophic result. After some days, I knocked on that same consultant's door. I remember him looking up from his desk at me as I said, I just can't stop thinking about it. In instinctively, he knew what it was. I sat down and he told me that I must always be brave and responsible enough to look at and examine my mistakes honestly, but that's not the same as punishing yourself. He told me about the risk that comes with increasing seniority in medicine. And then he told me about his own mistakes and I no longer felt so alone. So there's something psychologically to bear the demands that we need to have that that our own experience, early experiences will be activated and that we need the support of others. And this really it was this trainee who who I um, did some telephone session with in early FY uh, early 2019. She was a Scottish trainee, so she didn't come and see me in person. And she came out with this stream of consciousness. Um, I'm run ragged. I can't look at the patients in the way that I want. I've been shouted at by my seniors. I'm all by myself in this giant hospital covering the post-surgical ward while my seniors are in theatre. I feel so alone. alone. And I think that, that is, this just came out of her and I sort of got it down in shorthand. And I sought her permission to be able to use it, which she gave me. But I think that that's very similar. And, and, and in my book, I do, it, I do disclose that I had per, uh, postnatal depression. And I, and, and I could see that. And I felt, you know, I can't look after the baby in the way that I want. I've been shouted at by my seniors. You know, other uh, par parents and grandparents are sort of telling me just to pull myself together. I feel all by myself. I feel so alone. So I think that there, it can be useful. And we have to realize that both in medical school and definitely beyond, support doesn't always happen. And without looking at the world through, being accused of looking at the world through rose tinted spectacles, I think that there are also many ways in which supportive relationships, certainly in medicine have been eroded. Med school intakes are much larger Foundation doctors now move all over the country. Foundation rotations last four rather than six months. Sometimes they last two times two months. Um, doctors living off site and the removal of the doctor's mess and replacing the old style firm with a shift system. So it's not that any, it's not the old style firm was, you know, horrible things, bullying, horrible things, sexism, racism, homophobia, all sorts of things sometimes went on with the firm. But I think that we really need to be looking from the beginning of training, particularly with medical schools getting larger, about the quality of supportive relationships that people have. And we need to realise that some people have very, very few supportive relationships as they're going through training, which is actually why doing things like they were asking in that University of Washington right at the beginning, trying to get a picture of who was out there to support people can be very useful, but it has to be done post selection and the students have to feel that it's not going to be shared with um, uh, those involved in their academic training. We also need to acknowledge, sadly, the impact of racism, which is an issue in medical schools, systemic racism. Um, we know all the issues around differential attainment. Um, and some of you may be aware of the incident, what happened in Cardiff Medical School and the subsequent inquiry following it. And just things like when a medical, when a patient says that um, they don't want to be examined by a black or Asian, a, a bay medical student and the consultant saying, well, you know, sometimes patients don't want to be examined by medical students. That's not an adequate response. And that was the response in the, one, of the, one of the kind of one of many issues which came out in the Cardiff report. There are all can be all sorts of subtle ways in that, too. And I think racism is so corrosive because it eats away at that sense that one's actually good enough to do this incredibly demanding job. 
Um, and just having a look at time. How are we doing? Sorry, my phone. Uh, yeah, we're so understanding the impact of transitions. This is a saying. Uh, it's a wonderful book, experiencing endings and beginnings, but um, by Iska Seltzer Wittenberg. And in it, she says the German saying, "Alle Anfang." I apologise for my pronunciation. Is fair. Every beginning is difficult. Draws attention to the fact that starting something new may also be difficult and make us anxious. We may wonder whether we can live up to what is expected of us, not knowing whether we have the physical, mental, emotional capabilities to deal with the new situation. We tend to underestimate how powerfully seemingly ordinary beginnings and endings may affect us. I think that that um, slide should be, people should really, you know, have that printed on their walls. So very briefly, um, and Jonathan, can I just check you can, you'll, you'll be able to, because I can't see people's slides. I'd like you to, just to think about and maybe put on a piece of paper to list uh, and hold it up to your camera. And, and Jonathan's going to just give me a sense of this. Just list the transitions, locations and or team that a current student would, would experience if they were to train currently in your own discipline, starting with that undergraduate training. It doesn't need to be exact, but if we think, you know, if somebody was going to end up, if you're a GP, how many transitions would they have um, in training as a GP? And, and, and then crucially, how does that differ from your own training? It may, in fact, that I realise the question may be too, it may not, it may be rather difficult to answer, but top of your, I, what I'm just a ballpark figure about how many times you've rotated through different jobs as an undergraduate and as a postgraduate and how that compares from your own training. I'll give you just a couple of minutes to do, a minute or so to do that and just hold, or else you can put them, put, put it into chat. And if you put your cameras on, if you can, that would be that would be good, so we can see the numbers. Good point. Thank you. Oh, I'm I'm glad, John. I'm not entirely sitting in my <laughs> study talking to myself. It's nice to hear a voice out there. So, so if you hold them, I'll try and sit, have a look and see um, what. Just what just a few would be helpful. I'll put it in the chat. Um, how many transitions? I'm still uh, working on this one. <laughs> it might be a bit complicated. I see 25 there. Yeah. Yeah. We've got an 18 in the chat, Jonathan. And okay. 12, an 18. Um, yeah. Oh, so far in your career. So presumably quite a few to go then. Yeah. Let me just look at some of the other screens. Um, Well, I can't, quite a few people haven't got cameras on, so it's hard to say, but. It's, uh, I, I, okay. I mean, then it's something to think about, something to think about afterwards, but I just want people. Chat, we've got um, 34, at least 14 transitions to become GP, 20 to become a hospital doctor, yeah. around okay. 20, you know, so you get this quite a so lot. So kind of QED, if every beginning is difficult, how many beginnings are these people having? Each time having to prove yourself, get to know how you work, get to know the dynamics of the team, find somebody you can go through for help. I'm not saying it's wrong, but we need to understand how much there's just a crazy amount of shifting around in these different clinical trainings. Um, and if one wants to look at this more academically, Holmes and I never know if it's Holmes and Ra or Holmes and Ray looked at the effect of transitions on actually on physical health and as some of you may know and they then weighted those and the death of a spouse is the is the is the is the transition in one's life that is most that has the most profound um if you take a sample of people effect on on on, on their well-being and included in their list 
including just in the homes and RAS scale, change to a different line of work, change in responsibility in working hours, in residence, in social activities, in sleeping habits, number of family reunions, in eating habits. These have a less effect than one's partner dying, but they have an effect. And we are asking people to make those sorts of changes all the time. And we need to be attuned to the fact that they can be disruptive. So at each state of training, need to identify those who are likely to need more support. And this can be done by exploring the individual's education and career history. This should be the starting point with all individuals. So it's not something that is only done with individuals in difficulty, but there needs to be an openness and a an un greater understanding of how challenging the transitions can be. And, a gr and, and, and an understanding that prevention is always better and cure and exploring the support networks the individual has in place, particularly with some international medical graduates. I am shocked how isolated they, their, their family, some a partner and children, and that perhaps is more frequently a wife and children in another country, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a husband looking after children in another country or a husband with them and the children with grandparents in another country. And, and asking, we need to look at people's support because sometimes it can be woefully thin. Um, and I just want to, this was an email I got a, a while back from a doctor I talk about in the book, whom I call Kelly, who was actually mine thinking about yesterday's um, V vaccine day and the all around the country, the, the first uh, lovely lady who was given the first vaccine in the UK. This was the first doctor who came to see me in the careers unit. And um, I tracked her down and she agreed to be, she agreed to um, talk to me for the, for the book. And she was somebody who had walked out, as an FY1, who'd walked out of trans, um, her foundation in six weeks and was never going back. She was now about to be a consultant psychiatrist. She did go back the following year with a lot of support. But one of the things by looking at taking a proper history I, we saw that transitions were always difficult. She wasn't called Kelly, but I call her Kelly in the book. Um, and that had started with the shift from, from primary to secondary school, the shift from, from secondary school to sixth form college, the beginning year at med school, she'd had a mega wobble. And actually it was very transformative when she saw this acute distress she was under when she first began hospital she understood that this was just a repetition of a pattern that there was a vulnerability there but when she saw she'd got through all the previous things she realized that perhaps she could get through and she did and yes there was still a vulnerability there but she, and it was interesting um I picked up your book again recently this this arrived in my uh email very recently um uh and how it was helpful her for her to see this longer term pattern. So finally, seeing the bigger picture, let me just, yeah. Um, I don't want to name and shame, so I haven't said where this paper comes from. A good healthcare professional is one who's compassionate to themselves and their own well-being, enabling them to care and treat their patients. No, no, that is not the way forward. Self-compassion is a little bit of the picture, but, but if we're really looking at it, we need to be looking at the workplace or the educational factors. So the GMC did a major report last year, headed up by Michael West, an occupational psychologist like myself. And he's very firm about, he's looking at the factors at work, the factors in hospitals, I would say also the factors that they encounter at med school, rather than on initiatives to improve the ability to cope with stress or provide treatment when they become unwell. We need to be looking at the environment. And briefly, West talked about an ABC. And although this is written in terms of supporting doctors at work, actually, they all, um, they all map onto, I would argue, to, to the training, to the, to the undergraduate training as well. Having some control over their lives, acting consistently with work and values, autonomy, belonging, the need to be connected to, cared for, and caring of others around us in the workplace or in the university, to feel valued, respected, and supported. I think that 
last line, valued, respected and supported. That's the vulnerability point why racism is it can be so corrosive and competence, the need to experience effectiveness and deliver valued outcomes such as high quality care. We need to feel that you're doing a good job and, and build up the confidence that you're going to be a good enough doctor, not a perfect doctor, a good enough doctor. Um, and so if we think about building resilience, it's a complex and dynamic interplay between the individual, the environment and sociocultural factors. Yes, there's individual vulnerability, but the environment they're working and the broader sociocultural factors are also really important. And we mustn't have interventions to provoke, promote resilience, deal with organizational as well as individual and team issues. That's really important. And finally, the final thing I just want to talk about re really is this idea. It's often said, I've been reading a, a book on um, Claire Girardi's new book on uh, Beneath the White Coat. And she talks about uh, detached concern and the, this idea that we should be training practitioners to be able to become to have concern, but with an element of detachment, and it makes perfect sense. But actually, there is other sense. There's other more contemporary because detached concern. Um, um, Harold Leaf and I can't remember the other woman. It comes from the 60s or 70s. It's it's old research. Um, it's is is actually challenging this idea that you shouldn't be feeling any. You shouldn't. Uh, the, I, some people will talk about you need to. We need to be training students so that they have a cognitive, a kind of theoretical understanding, but they don't feel anything of what their patients are feeling. And and Jean Desity, who's at the University of Chicago, is 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 challenging that and says patient physicians with greater empathic concern for their patients with more uh, for their pa uh, for, for their patients were more satisfied with their work. And what we need to be doing is not this detachment, but it's this emotion, a capacity for emotional regulation rather than emotional detachment is absolutely key. So, yes, I think that there are moments where you need if you have to do something to a patient and it's very traumatic, there are moments where you have to psychologically step back. But the idea that the stance that we want to be encouraging in our students is so that they purely understand the suffering of their patients, but they don't feel anything of it is actually not the way forward. We need to we need to give them the capacity to regulate. So there are times where they absolutely have to step back, but also the space and the time and the uh, ability to then reconnect with their feelings and think about it and feel it so that it doesn't become overwhelming. Um, tentative conclusions. Um, healthcare work is emotionally demanding, but this psychological aspect is often overlooked in selection and training. There's a systemic failure to fail embedded in healthcare training. Students who are not gonna succeed in undergraduate or postgraduate training are sometimes allowed to continue in the system for too long without being given the help they need to make a career switch. Different specialties impose different psychological demands, yet support for identifying a suitable specialty can be poor. Transition points can be particularly demanding. And practitioners can be moving to new jobs in parts of the country where they have no systems of support. History gathering is as vital educationally as it is clinically and should be standard educational practice. I would like to offer a course on forensic CV reading. Um, like there's forensic accounting, you can just ask everybody who comes your way, everybody to bring a CV. And actually difficulties, time out, all sorts of stuff can just come out of a, of, of, of a, of a, a supportive, but quite detailed uh, review of somebody's CV. In terms of reducing burnout, well, individual resilience has a part to play, far more important to team and organizational factors. Emotional detachment from the patient in front of you doesn't protect you from burnout. Instead, emotional regulation needs to be the aim. And ult ultimately, the well-being of clinical practitioners needs an approach that considers not only the individual, but all the systemic workplace factors as well. So I hope I have given you a sense of 
why it might be, some of the issues that haven't been thought about, and, and some of the ways in which sometimes students, practitioners are, are made to feel less than human in their work. And that's why I have had the experience of, of being um, introduced as somebody who's written a book called Almost, rather than also human. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Caroline, and I think uh, there's a round of applause happening if you, if you can't hear it. <laughs> uh, that's so um, challenging, thought provoking, I think, for us all. I don't, uh, just monitoring the chat, everyone have a look at it because there's a lot in there and we're not going to be able to cover it all, I don't think. But I'm going to pass over to Pam um, to, to sort of help us with some discussion and questions. It's great. So thank you very much, Caroline. That was absolutely um fantastic i have been um, sort of monitoring the chat and i've tried to pick out some themes forgive me if i haven't got them all i think that these chat the chat will be available um to all um post conference i think we started off as and um, again forgive me if i um, mispronounce the names helena mckeek from northern ireland i presume because she picked up on the point of um when you said about interviewing and um, actually meeting all of our students and i think some some of our regulations um prevent us from doing that particularly in northern ireland and um, they're not allowed to interview view non-EU applications and um, so that's interesting so they have to take you know if they meet um, sort of certain criteria they, they're in they have a place so that's one point that there's no sort of sieving out or sort of actually um, meeting the individuals um, Caroline go ahead yeah but then but then you have to realize you haven't done that and therefore the contract with them from the outset you know in all the material that they're being sent is most of them it's going to be fine but it's possible that it won't be sent because you haven't been able to meet that so that it's raised and out there right from the outset and I know people uh, you know I'm uh, people don't want to do this and I can understand why they don't want to do this because it seemed to be unsupportive or, or, or whatever. But I think that if it was raised right from the outset, then it's easier to have a discussion. It's easier for that student to have a discussion with their parents. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And teachers as well. And there was a lot about the pre-application stage. Um, I think sort of some students and I, sorry, some students, some um, participants, and I recognize some as um, some students, they actually came on and said they had no clue about the reality of what they were entering up into. Oh, okay. they, knew, they knew it would be lots of exams, but they didn't realise the disruption to their their yeah. informal yeah. lives, yeah. moving yeah. about the country, yeah. moving yeah. from... Yeah. 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 Be, because people's I, people have got the idea about what it's like from these TV programs. Where unless they come from a medical family, we could ask people, you know, where if what they and and I have to say, some of the fly on the wall. There was one on St Mary's in London that I think approach began to approach. I mean, I haven't watched them all. When I was writing the book, I could watch them and tick that, tell myself I was um, researching. Um, when I wanted time out, but I, I, people, yeah, people, how could, how could they know? So, but then we need to know that they've gone in not knowing many of them and they, and to make it easier to have a discussion about maybe it's not right for you. They need to go and, and to have a, a without, they need to always be able to places that can go with a without, as lawyers would say, without prejudice conversation where they can put all the everything they're feeling on the line without it going straight back to the academic side of things and and crucially those providing support need to realize that reassurance isn't that they need to listen more than they need to reassure because often people will say oh well you're in the x year students often feel like that da, 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 da. and i've had people who told that they've been reassured and encouraged year in year out and nine years down the line they say actually i've had enough yeah, yeah. And the other thing, Caroline, and I'm listening to your answers as well, because I know that when one student said to me, Pam, I heard what you said, I heard what you said, I tried it, I'm not going to try repeating my final year for a second time. And I, my heart went out to him. But yeah, you're right, it's about listening. Um, the other thing that's come out quite strongly in the chat is how do we teach emotional regulation? 
What a question. Over to you, Caroline. I'm glad, I'm glad I can say, well, I'm a very strict time. I think we, I mean, that obviously that's where some of the things like the mindfulness, some of the things that one can learn from CBT or reframing, so that there are some practical techniques. There are some of, also some of the self-care, getting people to think about what are the things that you do other than going down to the pub? What are some of the things that you do that help help you, you know, sort of switch off. But I think also that we need, there needs to be effective role modeling um, so that more senior clinicians will talk about difficult times that they've had. And, and, and so people feel that, that it's acceptable to share it with somebody else. So role modeling right the way across. And, and things like Barlink groups, like Schwartz rounds, they should be for medical students as, they should be for medical students as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be a preliminary, so probably unsatisfactory mm -hmm. answer. Some very specific wanting some tips. So um, around how do we um, enable parents to understand that medicine might not be for their, their daughter? And then someone else has said, I'm interviewing students in January, what should I look out for? I, th I think that any one med school can't do it because they also are finan they have financial pressures on them, even more so currently, and they don't want to be pushing people away. But the medical school's council could do it and that they could. I, there was once a medical school council MSC document, which I could never find again. And it said something like medicine's a broad church. And if you're accepted, there's a branch of it for everyone. And I thought, you know, you wouldn't say flu, you know, you wouldn't say everybody's going to get better from flu. What is the evidence for that statement? It was just a profoundly non-evident space. So I think that there need to be from the collectives of medical schools information that, that goes out to schools and that goes out to parents. It can't rest with the... Um, uh, it can't rest with the medical school. As for the final question, and I know it's um, one minute, I think, you know, it's amazing to me that some students, some universities are still using old fashioned interviews when rather rather than, you know, OSCEs uh, uh, or, you know, MMI. MMI. Yeah. It is amazing to me. And um, when there is clear evidence base and, and expert groups and blah, blah, blah. I think that it's not asking people, it, it's putting them in, in, in as difficult situations as you can do. I always thought the one from uh, McMaster's when you had to comfort somebody whose cat had died or whatever, putting them thinking up novel ways, which is gonna push them a little bit out of their comfort zone. I think that that is probably the, the, the most robust way. And then there's the final question. I think I don't know how we're doing for time. I don't no, we're, know. We're just about out, Pam, but maybe maybe a quick. Okay, one. Last question. This is. I think everyone will um, experience this. It was, came from Pip, but I'm going to put a sort of more general um, term on it. So even although medical schools um, publish that the deanery ranges from X to Y, so it always seems to be the places where students least oh. likely to go to. In Pip's case, Preston. Bristol's case, probably Weston. Nottingham's case, Boston, all the ons at the end. Um, how do we, so, so it's in the, the um, data in our publications to say that you will be expected to go to all these places, yet it seems to become a, um, a surprise when students are allocated those placements. You ask them at interview. How would you, you ask them that, that? Are you asked questions about, you know, so you make it absolutely clear that you've discussed that at interview, discuss it with everybody at interview and how they might cope with that. Fantastic. So I think my um, our admissions leads there. So hopefully um, she's picked up in that. Because I'm, I'm a very, I'm a nasty, you know, people, some, I think people think I'm a very nasty woman, but I, I hope I'm not. I just don't. I, I have spent a lot of my, you know, the last decade seeing people who have really struggled. And I'm going yeah. to have to um, yeah, that's close right. that discussion yeah. there. Fascinating though it is. And I would direct everyone into the chat uh, because there's so much good stuff in there. Please, please do read it. Um, and maybe we can come back to it if there's time later. 
So, um, Caroline, thank you again so much Pleasure. for your talk today. We've really appreciated it. And we, you've given us a lot to, to think on and quite a few books to read, I think, in that. Um, <laughs> all of them sounded like ones we should go and read it, read up. Yeah, Seven Signs of Life is great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Pleasure.